Hey, what up, boxing fans? This is the Rope Dope Radio Podcast. I am your host, Chris Carlson. We're live, per usual, six on the west, nine on the east, and two UK. Oh, shoot, something just. I think my mic's working now. That was really weird. Anyway, we are live, as I was saying. Two UK time, I think I was saying that right when my mic just popped. That was really weird. Anyway. We got a good show for you tonight. It's just good. It's not great. It's just good, guys, okay? We got a good show for you. Obviously, we're going to recap the HBO and PBC on FS1 cards, uh, you know, headlined by Billy Joe Saunders, just toying with David Lemieux. We'll recap, like I mentioned, some of that PBC FS1 Molina red catch. That was a great fight to go along with a couple other good performances. That was headlined by Jesse Vargas just trying to get some rust off of his layoff and so we'll talk about those things to start with recap per usual um obviously not a whole lot of fights coming up for the rest of the year beyond um the japanese new year's festival the boxing festival right they usually have new year's eve and new year's day back to back uh cards i believe they have at least one i think that's both of them though both days but either way it's going to be, after the recap, it'll be heavy news. It'll, I mean, there's a lot of news either breaking or a lot of rumor mill items that we've been talking about that are coming to fruition. Um, since we last talked, Mikey Garcia signed a fight with Sergey Lipinets. It's a fight we talked about that was going to be announced very soon. We even thought maybe last Thursday, and sure enough, it got, um, it got announced now, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about this fight and Mikey Garcia. So I'm going to have a little Mikey Garcia rant a little later in the show. We'll also talk about a fight that HBO signed as a co-feature uh, coming in March. That's really good. Also, just ESPN, HBO, and, and especially the Showtime schedule. We've been talking about the Showtime first quarter for quite some time and you know, when are they going to release it? Did, did they, are they going to, were they planning on releasing it prior, you know, to, to uh, Christmas or after Christmas? Or will it come out a little piece by piece and then they'll release a, a major chunk? We still don't totally know, but we do have a lot more information that is beyond rumor mill. Let's put it that way. If this is the first time listening to the Rope It Up Radio podcast, you can check us out like you're doing right now now uh, live at blogtalkradio.com forward slash Rope It Up Radio. It, it, it streams live for two – excuse me. It streams lives. It streams live for two hours there, and it also archives there. It's kind of the headquarters. But you can also check it out at Apple Podcast, a.k.a. iTunes. Sometimes when I say Apple Podcast, people are like, what the hell is that? That's just iTunes. You can rate and review the show there. That really helps the show as far as visibility and whatnot. Player FM is another great source as well. Stitcher, Spricker, TuneIn, and many, many more outlets where you like to listen to your podcast. You can check out the Rope Dope Radio anytime. And, of course, the College Ball Show, although it took a week off this week, it'll be back next week. We cover football and basketball that blends into the spring and then goes to the NBA uh, playoffs and whatnot, free agency. Anyway, we can also, we joined probably about a month ago now, the Rope It Up Radio podcast has joined forces with the GruelingTruth.net. Go visit the GruelingTruth.net. They got a great sponsor there, MyBookie.ag. Go check that out as well. And uh, we became a part of the family, the Grueling Truth sports podcast i mean boxing football basketball not just nowadays stuff some historic stuff they just had james tony george foreman on the show as well so make sure to check out the grueling truth sports podcast network you can you know catch it there at the grueling truth.net all of the uh outlets i just named for the rope it over radio podcast you can check it there i know they got i think it's spricker they got a great app. Check out the app as well for GruelingTruth.net. You can also check out that podcast network on iHeartRadio. So I had to kind of get that out of the way. And now 
we can start the show. And we always start with recap. That's generally how we do it, unless there's some crazy news like like Floyd Mayweather, right? If Floyd Mayweather's in the news, we may lead with that. So why don't we lead with that? A couple, what, about 10 days ago, he talked about if he wanted to, he could come back to UFC, and in three or four fights, he could make a bill. It kind of sounded like they were offering him a deal. <laughs> then Dana White says, we're actually in negotiations. Then Mayweather says, no, we're not today. UFC is in negotiations, as we know, with Fox. They're, they're looking for, what was it, four or $500 million a year? And Fox is willing to give them $200 million a year. So maybe they're just bringing up Mayweather as a maybe <laughs> to entice <laughs> the uh, the UFC New Deal. Anyway, that's enough for the, the, the late-breaking news. Otherwise, like I said, it's Garcia rant. Um, it, it's just a bunch of news. Sullivan Barrera has a fight that's going to be very, very challenging. Some other ru- rumors. And, and, and like I said, it's really not rumors. Most of them are pretty solid. Just a matter of when we're going to get it announced, basically. When it comes to fights 2018, if you look at the schedule, man, it's looking pretty good. It's looking pretty good. I'd also like to join or, or welcome those joining us here on uh, the YouTube stream. It'll probably go up for about an hour, then we'll shut it down. If you want to, uh, if you got to, you know, maybe you can't listen to it on YouTube the whole time, you can call 646 381 That's 646 381 or you could just use that link right there in the description box. And, you know, for those who are listening to it, uh, it's 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 Thursday. It's Friday. It's Saturday now. It's right before Christmas. It's around Christmas, right? For those listening there and they, they kind of want to hear more of the show and, and kind of more people, the, the, the co-host, I, I guess you could say, everybody that calls in, I kind of just, you know, I, I kind of claim them as co-hosts. So you can listen to it. It's got a link right there in the description box, the fully archived, or like I said, you can listen to it live right as we speak. So, Billy Joe Saunders, we're going to start with HBO, we'll cover that triple header, then we'll go to the PBC on FS1, which by the way, the last two weeks, PBC cards have been the most entertaining, by the way, for those keeping track at home. Um, Just the hardcore fans, the Friday Night Fight fans, that type of fan. Uh, the Showbox fan, um, the, the the fan that's going to basically try to at least give a give it a watch, whether no matter what it is, even some of those tape delay Golden Boy ESPN two cards, right? Those type of numbers is what that thing's getting pretty much over there. But anyway, let's go to the HBO card. HBO is done now for the season. Um, so is the FS1 cards, by the way. Maybe they're done, done like for good too. Um, until we find out anything about any kind of Fox deal with the PBC, contractually they're, they're done. They're they're done as of right now. We'll see if they sign some sort of deal, or maybe they'll do another, um, you know, time by deal. They've done two deals, time by deals with Fox so far. So we'll see. Anyway, Billy Joe Saunders. I talked last week how a lot of people just don't like this guy and some some of it's skewing, some of that hate, and some of it, I understand some of the dislike for him or, or whatever you want to say, right? I get some of it. I do get some of it because there's certain comments that a fighter, as I said last week, that a fighter <laughs> says that you're just, you're going to get destroyed for. I just there's just no way around it. If you can hear some interviews, even if it's taken out of context, like I said last week, even if it's out of context, you're still going to get a fair amount of hate. And he said he has said several things over the years. And I understand a lot of people thought he was holding the belt hostage. And I think some of that was him being hurt. Some of that was him not taking a fight you know, a, a couple of falls ago, that's for sure. Um, but I'd say the last year or something, I, I wouldn't blame Billy Joe Saunders. I mean, he's had injury. 
He's had fighters pull out on him. He thought he had the Canelo fight. He thought he had the Golovkin fight. He thought he had a fight with Little Tyson. He got arrested. So you can't really fault him of late. But, you know, a lot of people say he was hiding the belt. You know, I, I don't know, man. He had fought Eubank Jr. and Andy Lee, you know, which is just as, I mean, it's better opponents than Lemieux had fought, in my opinion. Um or just as good. I shouldn't say that because Golovkin obviously tops that out, but he was a no-show. And speaking of no-show, what do you know? Lemieux was a, another no-show. Another another no-show in his top fight. And when we say no-show, we mean complete no-show. Like, wow, really? Like, how did this happen? I, I Some of this stuff is just, it's pretty crazy. I'll say that. It's pretty crazy, some of this stuff, where you're just like, all the things that people said about Lemieux, and it's just, I don't know. It's pretty funny, man. It's really funny, in fact. But anyway, I'm getting a little sidetracked, because once again, someone said they had a little problem with hearing me. So that seems like it's gone away. All right, so... It's funny, actually, <laughs> because uh, what's his toes? Abel Sanchez today. I just saw it on uh, bad look, uh, bad look, bad look, bad left hook. I think it is. Um, just saw something the other. You know, I think it was today or yesterday. Abel Sanchez. Now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, yeah, it was bad, bad left hook. Big shots out to, to bad left hook, by the way. But he says, Saunders beat a punching bag, a guy with two left feet. But as we know, <laughs> he wasn't saying that about Lemieux back then. Now I'm not saying that he was, you know, out here saying this guy's a Hall of Famer. But he sure wasn't saying he had two left feet. Um, and I just, my whole point is Lemieux hadn't done a whole lot either. It just, when he got his belt, all of a sudden he got lined up and it, the Golovkin fight was there. You know, and it helps that he, you know, had fought on, uh, he had with Golden Boy and they're with HBO and whatnot. So, anyway, I get how some people don't like him. Um, although they like other shit talkers, but they don't like him. You know, and, and uh, the theme was let's rid the boxing world of Billy Joe Saunders. And I think that's, I think it's, some of it's kidding and joking, some of it's, being just over the top, having fun. Some people are just like that because they do that like on social media or podcasts or in their forums and their articles or on YouTube. They just, they just go over the top no matter what. And so some of it's like funny and some of it's dead serious. They get this serious about boxing where they, they want to disown a guy and never have him come back again, rid him. You know, rid Saunders of us. That's where a lot of people thought they wanted Lemieux to win. And a lot of people pick Lemieux by knockout. And although he could have knocked him out potentially, but I just thought a lot of the hate got skewed once again into completely overlooking Billy, John, Billy Joe Saunders in the ring, especially when he's been in good shape like he was in his last fight. And you could tell coming into this fight that he was. He was in great shape. So... We got to basically is what I'm saying is we got to just calm down sometimes. You know, you can have your opinion about a guy. Feel free to. But if you're going to just predict, at least say it in the prediction. You know, that, I guess maybe that's it. Just say it right out, right out front and say, I don't like him. This is why I'm picking him. I can respect that. But for the guys that kind of just completely disrespected him, I just, I don't know. I think it's kind of funny. That's all. I think it's just a little funny and, and, you know, obviously that backfired. That's for sure. But um, I was surprised, though, on just how one-sided this fight was. I mean, I'm not going to sit here. Just because I picked Billy Joe Saunders, I'm not going to sit here and all of a sudden, you know, be like, oh, I knew he was going to do all this, you know. <laughs> That's just not me. I don't like doing that. I think it comes across as very fake. 
Um, I didn't think he'd handle them like this. I really didn't. I, I didn't think at all like that. No way. I wouldn't have guessed that. But he did. He most definitely did. And when you look at the the scorecard, could you really give too many rounds to him? I mean, no, you really couldn't. It was it was it was bad. Billy Joe Saunders came out sharp. He was that jab, that one two, really nice straight lefts once in a while. You know, in that second round, he almost had him knocked out on, or knocked down, excuse me, knocked down, not knocked out, <laughs> knocked down on the ropes, if you look at it. If you look at that, it, it was pretty close. It was like, whoa, he did he did he get some help from that rope? He may have. He may have. But the jab, the movement, the timing, I'd say about third or fourth round, finally, you could see Lemieux landing something. But it was, you know, it was, it just wasn't effective at all. And then somewhere in the sixth or seventh, you could see a more aggressive Billy Joe Saunders hitting, you know, Lemieux with some thudding shots, making his nose bleed. He may have broke his nose. Just a textbook clinic, but with hard shots. You know, after eight rounds, the punch stat, 115 to 142. That's Lance. Wow. Overall, and then, like I said, I mean, I don't know, in the 11th and 12th, you know, finally you start, maybe in the 10th too, finally he started coming at him and, and trying to let his hands go, and he had some success super late, but th that was it. Overall, just just handle him. Easy win for Billy Joe Saunders. If you look at the punch stat, 165 to 67. Um, 430 overall as far as punches thrown to 356, 38% and 19%. That was the difference. 103 to 12 as far as jabs landed, which that's another stat where you're like, wow, that is completely dominating, completely dominating. And that's really all that can be said. Now, of course, of course, at the end of this, Lemieux had to make an excuse about running. He said his hand also hurt in the second round, but he also said, well, he was running. So what was I going to do? You know, and it, I just think it's so funny. You know, it's one thing. It's one thing for boxing fans to do this when their beloved boxers don't perform up to their standard or they had spent all week talking a bunch of trash and their guy got beat, guy or gal, however you want to look at it, right? It's one thing for that, right? But when the fighter, I, I just, come on, dude. Like, if you hurt your hand, that, that sucks, you know? That does suck. And, and I'm sure that would have something to do with you not, you know, getting the job done. And that, I get that. But he, you notice how he made sure to throw in running. So hurting your hand doesn't have shit to do with cutting off the ring. Because you got another hand. And like I said, the combo excuse tells you a lot. And it, 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 it is funny. Like I said, you can, the fans, you kind of expect that from fans to an extent. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just think it's such a cop-out, man. Such a cop-out. It's like, dude, just, it's okay, man. You got beat. We all saw it. It was real easy to see. You weren't going to win the fight no matter, you know, how good or bad your hand was. So, I don't know. Some of that was just, it's just the normal excuses. But like I said, in this case, to sit there and, like, why don't you have a plan for it then? That, that That's my thing. Have a plan then, dude. You know, and they used to do this with Mayweather as well. It is funny, though, how we pick and choose. And I think there is some differences out there. Don't get me wrong. But it is funny how we pick and choose on what's a master class performance and what's not. You know, I think that's kind of funny because um, because we kind of go back and forth to how we rate that. But anyway, you know. 
Saunders, uh, you know, I was talking about pole position. That That's basically what this scene, or not the scene, but, you know, what we called it, pole position. Because that's basically what this fight was. It was creating a good position for you. Now, there's other, you know, fans out there that are trying to create good positions or, or fighters for themselves, too, at that weight. And one of them is uh, Daniel Jacobs. He's positioned himself on HBO with a deal. Obviously, he has a uh, promoter, Nanny Hearn. Could they do a fight there? You know, Daniel Jacobs came out right away and uh, said, hey, I want to fight him in my next fight. In fact, Daniel Jacobs is due back at the Barclays Center April 28th on HBO. So that would be my first news part. April 28th, Daniel Jacobs due on HBO at the Barclays Center in his hometown of Brooklyn. All right? So um, that's a tough fight for Danny. It's a tough fight for Billy Joe. Um, Danny has just enough, just as much, if not more power as David Lemieux, I think he can cut the ring off better. He's got quicker feet. He's got faster hands. Um, he's shown what he could do when he faced Golovkin, comparatively. Um, but he's also, you know, open on defense, susceptible on defense, because he's so close to you, or or sometimes he overextends himself going for it. And Billy Joe Saunders had his little hot dog Roy Jones moment or, or even like the Canelo Floyd Mayweather moment where, you know, Lemieux just missed horrendously with a right. And Billy Joe looked off in the distance almost like he's looking at – like he's a captain of the ship and he's seeing land and he's screaming, land ho. It was like, where was that shot landing? You know what I mean? Um, and the the the, the – the call lines are starting to fill up. Some people want to talk. Some people don't. 214 I see on there. I'm just going to kind of get the uh, intro recap over, and then I'll get to you. I see CT just popped on as well. Anybody else on there uh, that wants to talk, you know, feel free to press 1. If you're just chilling, that's cool. 646-381-4990 is the number to call. Maybe you're stuck in traffic on the West Coast. Maybe you got to go grocery shopping, run some errands. With the wifey, 646-381-4990. Um, but I got to be honest. If I were Eddie Hearn, and I'm not, by the way. If I were Eddie Hearn, I, uh, I wouldn't put him in with Billy Joe Saunders. Not when you have, I'm not saying, oh, dude, he's afraid of it. He couldn't do anything. He could maybe beat him. I'm just saying, I'm talking about Daniel Jacobs at this point. I'm just saying, if you got you know some some career money coming up again, I would go for him because it's not like Billy Joe Saunders is like some big name in the UK because he, he's just not. Not to say that they wouldn't have a nice paycheck for him because I think they will. Part of that Frank Warren Box Nation BT Sports over there, I think they would actually have some money for him, a nice check. But I don't think it would have to go over there. Is what I'm saying. Um. But I don't know, man. I don't think I'd do that. I know getting the belt's huge, and I talk about pole position and everything like that. But, man, that's a risky fight. That's a risky fight considering, you know, you're potentially what, you, what you're basically missing, you know, at that point. So, or potentially, you know, I don't know. It just, God, it's such a risk. It is such a risk. Um, but who knows? Who knows what they're going to do? But that that's my opinion. I think it's a huge risk, and, and I would advise against it. Not just being honest. That's not taking anything away from uh, – I'm not saying just because – I mean, I'm not going to Abel Sanchez and, and calling Lemieux a bum now either. Two left feet and all that. I'm not saying that. But, you know, I'm also not um, – I don't know. I'm just not going <laughs> to just not going to completely like call Saunders. He can outbox everybody on the planet. You know, I'm not saying that either. 
just kind of a combination of, of both. <laughs> I just wouldn't mess with them. That's a fight you can always have. You know what I mean? Like, let that be. I, I think that fight's there, but who knows? Maybe they will just go for it and say, screw it. I, 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 def- I don't know if I would. I, I'd be a little – it's just a weird style, like I said, money-wise coming up too, you know? Is it worth it? I don't know. Um, let's see the rest of that HBO. Then I'm going to get the PVC. Then I'm going to get some news, get to 214 as the caller as well. CT, got to get to him as well. Antonio Douglas and Gary O'Sullivan. Well, Sullivan wins the best mustache of the year for a boxer, I'd say. Got that old school looking like, uh, the butcher in, in, uh, I was going to say Game of Thrones. Gangs in New York looking like the butcher, Daniel Day-Lewis. He won the first round. It was a two-way round, but I thought the, the harder shots were landed by Sullivan. I thought Douglas, competitive run, but I thought Douglas won the second, and I gave him the third. I thought he landed the tad better shot. Uh, Sullivan, for me, although um, – Although Douglas did land some hooks and some combos, um, and there was some back and forth, I thought some really nice crosses and overhand right uh, landed well. Then Sullivan, for me, took over the fright, the fright, the fight. Pressure, body punching, started getting him on the ropes, and we started to see, was this baby Tyson, little Tyson? That uh, Yeah, it is. It totally is. Kurtzidis. He was the one who did this to Douglas, wasn't it? Yeah, he did. I think last last year. But anyway, same difference. Just started working him down. Six round, big right hands. I mean, he just out hustled him, outworked him, and then he was hurt on the ropes. Uh, basically, landed a, a couple of early shots, a few hard shots. Um, one of those shots was kind of on the side of the head. There was a knockdown, and then it was just like, you're done, dude. You know, it, it's over. And Douglas almost looked, I'm not going to say identical, but he, he had that look where his mouth was bloody. His face was just, I don't know. You know, he had the same look that he had in that loss. And it's just one of those looks where you look at a guy and you're like, wow. He just got beat up. And you feel bad for him. He's in there trying his his butt off, but it was it was eerily similar. Similar, excuse me. God, I can't talk tonight. It was eerily similar to that, though. At the end, where you're just looking at him, you're like, man, something doesn't look right with the guy. Like he just, man, I'm, I'm, you know what I mean. And that's what I saw anyway. So big win for Sullivan, though. Definitely a solid win for him. And then. Uh, what is it, uh, Ulysses? I think it's U- Ulysse. Um, I mean, he just whitewashed Cletus Selden. Knocked him down. Was it the first three rounds? Every There was an exchange, and it was a right hand in that exchange. Um, and then there was another shot. Actually, that first knockdown, actually, the, the, the left hand, there was an exchange that hurt Cletus. And I just love saying Cletus, by the way. Hey, Cletus, are you hurt? No, I'm sorry. But he hurt Cletus. He hurt him. But the right hand hurt him. But the, the left hand landed kind of in the shoulder neck area on Cletus. And I just, it was kind of a weird knockdown. But the right hand, uh, I think with probably like, let me see my notes, 75 seconds in, another knockdown, kind of a, uh, a flashy right hand or flush right hand with some combos. Another knockdown and a series of combos. After five rounds, it was 64 to 11. Just sticking and moving, pot shot. But when he pot shot, they were landing flush. I just didn't think um, Ulysses, I don't think he threw enough combinations. And I don't, when I say combination, it could be just two punches. Doesn't have to be three, four, five, and six. I'm saying, just a little bit more action because it was there. I, I did think that he lost the seventh round. Um, he did land a huge right hand, but he barely 
through anything. And the fight started heating a little little bit up, right, in, in the seventh and eighth, a, a little bit. But overall, nine to one I had it. Uh, like I said, you you list the other otherwise beyond just having to throw a little bit more combinations. I thought he looked pretty good, man. I thought he let look pretty good. Um, one fifty seven, man, one fifty seven to forty two. Uh, three sixty to three thirty three though. See, so you uptick that another forty sixty punches. You may take a little bit off your landing percentage, forty four percent. But still, 44% overall is a great landing percentage anyway. So even if you dip below 40, who cares? You may have gotten him out of there. But a really good performance by Luis, Luis or what is it? Is it Ulisse? Luis? Man, he, he looked good. He looked good. I know that there were moments where he could have kept up that pressure. So I think he could have dropped the ball a little bit there. But other than that, man, I thought he looked pretty damn good. I thought he looked pretty good. You know, for, for for what kind of fighter he looks to be. Could have improved on it. He's going to have tougher guys in front of him, no doubt about it. But I thought he looked pretty damn good, man. I really did. Um, let's see. Let's switch over to the PBC on FS1, as I mentioned earlier. Um Shoot. Oh, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, I thought this was the funner card. That's for sure. I think that was pretty easy to see. Um, really fun card. And back-to-back -back weekends where those Friday night PBC cards actually, you know, did better. As far as Jesse Vargas, this thing was kind of shaped around him. We'll have some more news about him and his next fight coming up here shortly. Um, I'll say this. Just because we're not accusing anybody. I always go over this when I talk about this. We're not. I'm not accusing anybody here at Rope It Up Radio, okay? I'm not accusing anybody. But I'm, I'm simply making an observation when I see a fighter in the ring. And I try to bring this up as many times. I, I write a little note when I see it. I'm just saying this. This is an observation about Jesse Vargas. I'm going to give several, you know, observations. A lot of it will have to do with what took place in the in the ring. But what I did see is really bad acne on his back, clearly, and on his chest. Now, maybe it's something that can be explained. A lot of athletes deal with acne. Um. But I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Not a, I'm not saying anything more than that. It's an observation. Um, he got a new trainer, too, which is kind of weird because he had a lot of – I thought he fought pretty well with his last one. But anyway, um, basically Vargas was getting the rust off. He took his time, got some rounds in. He landed, I mean, Aaron Herrera is a pretty tough dude. He actually fought Reels pretty hard. Uh, that was late summer, right? Um, or in the summer. He landed some few a few good punches from time to time. He was game, no doubt about it. The fourth round was pretty fun. I did say, you know, Vargas, I say he took his time. At times it looked like he was taking his time. Other times he, he did look a bit tentative. Um, in the sixth round, left hook definitely hurt. Um, Herrera could have been, you know, a combination could have, could have scored a not. Oh wait, was there a knockdown? Oh, you know what? I, I put this little note down. I don't know if anybody noticed this, but I think Jay, I think between the sixth and seventh round, Jesse Vargas damn near choked on some water. I don't know if anybody saw this. It almost looked like he, he either it was, it was one of three things. It was a panic attack. It was claustrophobia all of a sudden, or his or a trainer or a cornerman sprayed too much water in his mouth at one point in time because he literally like coughed, choked, and then had to get up away from everybody. Set, kind of put his arms on the rope, but just looked at his trainer like, "Dude, I need to breathe. Like, 
I almost choked there. You got to not give me as much water. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but he had this, it almost looked like he was about to puke. It was just like he was choking. And then all of a sudden you could see his eyes were kind of messed up. It was kind of a weird little thing. I, I don't know if anybody noticed that, but he got the rust off and that's what it was there for. Let's, let's be honest. That's what it was there for. The first fight though, Omatoso and Freddie Hernandez, that was a good little scrap too. Um, Omatoso came out, landed his, you know, his jab and landed better, better shots, left hooks and whatnot. Um, I thought Hernandez though, in the second round, he landed several clean left hooks. I think he did enough to win the second and the third round. Actually, I had him win in the fourth round as well. Harder shots. Like I said, those left hooks. Then I thought Omatoso kind of took it over. I'm looking at my scorecard right now. Um, the sixth, seventh. Those overhand rights started taking their toll. You know, Hernandez had a nice jab, but didn't land as many left hooks. He definitely hurt um, Hernandez. Definitely wobbled. But he rallied back in the eighth round. Uh, there was a head clash, accidental head clash. I think it was uh, Hernandez's right eye. Uh, but it was a good fight, man. It was a good little scrap. Um, I did think by about the Sixth round, he took over. Omotoso did 97 93. I think it was two, two had that. No, 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 97 93, 96 94, and then 100 to 90, which was just silly. What do you know? It's boxing and we got a bad scorecard. But I was like, really, dude? Like, what are we, what are we, what, what were you watching? I, I just don't understand that, man. Um, but either way, good win by Omotoso. I had him win him barely, but it was a good fight. Um, very good fight, I thought. Fun fight to watch. Um, what else do we got here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, another hometown kid. Uh, James, Jamal James, took on Diego Chavez. Um, Chavez actually came out pretty aggressive. I, I gave him the first round. And then... James actually flipped, flipped the script on a little bit, and he went forward. There were some nice, I think, late lands in there um, by uh, Chavez, but not enough. Then the jab, I think it was a left hand to the body, definitely bothered, bothered him, and, and it scored a knockdown. Then another left hand to the body, and it was a wrap. I mean, it was a, it was a quick little performance um, by James, who usually is an outside boxer. Um, who will mix it up a little bit, but usually a guy that uses his length. He's been in a lot of fights. He's been very active, so you got to give him credit for that. But a nice win by Jamal James, that's for sure, over Diego Chavez, who's a game dude as we know. Now, the fight of the weekend, even though it was a four-rounder, the fight of the weekend was um, John John Molina, John Molina and Ivan Redketch. I thought this was a fun, fun fight, man. And I gave Red Catch the first two rounds. Um, a few left hands, I'd say, landed pretty solid. That gave him the first round. And I think it was the last minute of that second round, Red Catch scored a knockdown via a bunch of rights and lefts. <laughs> Just throwing bombs, left hand barrage. Like he had him, and then he started just coming at it. And it was a good scrap because Molina responded. And not only did he respond, but in the third round, he came back and landed, I think it was at the 55-second mark, Molina, right hand, scored a great knockdown, right? Um, I think it was – was that the one that he landed in? It was a right-hand exchange, right? And, and Red Catch, they could have stopped the fight right there because Red Catch got up, right? And he literally – Getting up, he went outside of the ropes a little bit. And you're looking at the, the ref like, dude, did you just see him? He went outside the rope. Now, sometimes that can happen, and it's no big deal. You're just, you know, getting up, and you just happen to be in a weird spot. And you could only get up near the rope or whatever. But this was, to me, he was just kind of lost there. However, <laughs> I say he was lost going outside the ring, but both guys were landing. The last part of that third round was was really fun, man. They were getting it in. Molina, in the fourth round, several hard right hands. Good, good body shots, too. 
And then like a three or four punches in a row. TKO ref stopped it just on his ass was Molina. So just a fun little scrap out of nowhere. I mean, on paper, I, I like this card. I thought it was like, all right, dude, these are just mid-level fights. This is this works. I mean, obviously, the main event, we always say, if you got a main event, stay busy or tune up. You got to hook up the undercard. I think PBC FS1 did it, you know. And as I said, this will be their last. Basically, in the U.S., boxing's all but over for the year. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, Japan, the Japanese fighters, they usually have like a boxing festival, you know. They they sell they bring in the new year on New Year's Eve and day usually with um fight cards. So that's that's always cool, right? Um, but that's it. And like I mentioned earlier, that could be it for FS1. You know, the PBC and FS1, their first deal they signed um basically brought them from the fall of 2015 all the way to the end of 2016. They re up for another deal this year, which included, I think, three shows a month on FS1. Two of them were normally the Toe to Toe Tuesdays. The other one would be sometimes like a mid-level, sometimes a random one, sometimes some just filler stuff. Uh, a lot of prospect stuff, though, usually. Um, I think Benavidez in uh, uh, Medina was probably the best – one of the better cards on there. Oh, that Friday night before in August, before the uh, Mayweather McGregor, that was a good card too on FS1. Um, but we'll see, man. I sure would, even if they can't use Fox as the, you know, the the big Fox or whatever, you know, the the terrestrial free television channel. Even if they could just maintain these these toe to toe Tuesdays, I still think maybe they should change them into toe to toe Thursdays. And Fridays, just because it's much easier to draw at least a decent crowd rather than what you could do on Tuesdays. I mean, we, we've seen Friday Night Fights through the years, these ESPN cards, definitely these the Fox cards, um, the FS1 cards anyway. It is hard to draw a nice crowd. There, there are some areas um, throughout the country, little nooks and crannies that you can find. You saw that on Friday Night Fights throughout the years that they'd have a couple of nice places where they go and um, and, and sometimes they'd be outdoor fights and they, they draw a nice little crowd. But um, we'll see, man. We'll see because I sure would – I sure – I you know, that mid-level and prospect stuff is very important as we know in boxing. So I really hope they find a way to re-up that, that deal even if it is just for the toe-to-toe -to -toe Tuesdays, you know. But we'll see. We'll definitely see. And by the way, just as a reminder, uh, next week will be the 2017 year in review. The great, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's what we call it every year. 2017 has been a great year, and we're going to wrap it up all next Wednesday. Not tonight, but next Wednesday. So just keep an eye out for that. And then it'll be a two-week break, and then we'll be back in business um for some reason i've been getting a variety of calls tonight it's kind of weird on my phone and i'm trying to do the show a lot of these numbers don't look that familiar though so maybe that's why so anyway we're going to get to the callers here in just a moment i do want to go over a couple news items and then we'll dive a little bit deeper into the news so we'll just kind of breeze through some stuff and we'll bounce back with a little bit more detail um, just as far as fight news that got announced, actually, uh, as we know, we talked about this last Wednesday. It was basically finalized, I think, Thursday or Friday. Mikey Garcia returns to action against Sergey Lipinets. This will be in a measured down, of course, Alamo Dome in San Antonio. Uh, the tickets are priced smartly. They know that they're not going to sell a ton of tickets there, per se, like, they have, if you look at the tickets, they have just a, you know, a fourth of the stadium available, obviously, because it's a, what is it, 65, 70,000, maybe even more, something like that. But um, they have them priced really nice 20, 50, 75, 150, and 250. And 
I couldn't really find too many 20s and 50s left. But, yeah, 20, 50, 75. So 75 and under, that's pretty good to have three price points there. So I think they know, hey, it's a big venue. We're only going to measure it out for just a chunk of it. Um, kind of interesting stuff on the, the undercard. Um, Rancis Bartholomew, who, who – who took on, what is it, Relic? Relic, I think it is, Relic. That was a really close fight. Both guys hit the deck. Very tight fight. I'm so glad there's a rematch. That's going to be a co-feature. And also, a fight that hasn't been 100% announced, but it is a done deal. Alex Luna, who's an unbeaten 140-pounder, he's taking on Richard Comey, and that'll be for Robert Easter Jr.'s IBF 140 title eliminator. So Comey worked his way back. The last guy they had ready for this title eliminator, he chose not to take the fight. So now they have um, Alex Luna, who's an unbeaten guy. I think he's like 22-0, and 0, 15 KOs or 16 KOs. That's an interesting fight and um, good for Comey. I thought Comey and Easter Jr. at some point deserved a rematch, and he may just be able to fight his way back. So that's a Pretty good card. Now, the Lippinets fight, it is what it is. It's more of uh, get, get you to the next fight. I hate to say that the guy's unbeaten or whatever, but it's not like he had two, three, four hundred, you know, um, amateur fights. He actually was very successful as an amateur, um, just not um, in boxing. <laughs> it was kickboxing. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, I'll give my take in the whole Mikey Garcia because a lot of people have been jumping on Mikey Garcia lately. I got a little rant in there. I, I had a mini rant about this uh, a little bit ago, but I see the media getting involved. It's one thing for the fans, but when the media gets involved, then it just adds fuel to the fire um, if, if it's misleading. That's when it bugs me because you had a guy in Lance – uh, Lance Polgemeyer that I really like. I think he's very good at the LA Times. He wrote an article saying basically this is this is a head scratcher of a fight. Well, he also didn't know other information or didn't take the time to learn that Mikey and Golden Boy had already talked about the Lonares fight and how they planned on doing it a little later in the year. So so some of this has just been a little overreaching. People love to criticize, but then let other fighters off the hook. It's just kind of funny. But we'll, we'll get into that a little later. Um, Sullivan Barrera versus Dimitri Bivol. Or Bivol, however you say it. Um, Kovalev basically, it looks like a stay busy fight, but I got I to gotta learn a little bit more about his opponent. But it does, I got to admit, it kind of looks like a stay busy fight. But that could be ignorance, too. Just because I don't know the guy doesn't mean, you know, <laughs> it's that, right? So um, we're, I'm going to look a little bit more into that. That's for sure. But um, I'm – I so basically they're just keeping, keeping Kovalev going, right? Keeping him alive in that manner. Kind of working his way back, I'd say. Um, gosh, what the hell? Okay. For the people texting me right now, see if it's if it's good to go right now. Another person saying they're having a little problem with my mic every once in a while. and But why other people haven't, and even when I mentioned it earlier, they weren't saying that was a problem either, so... Who knows? Maybe it's on their end. Maybe it's on mine. I don't really know. But either way, just wrapping up some of this news. I really like that Barrera and Bivol fight, though. I guess, I guess Barrera turned down another offer for Kovalev, though. I guess he's he's saying that he's just going to build his worth and get a bigger contract next. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know, man. Well, of course, this one has a belt attached to it whereas Kovalev doesn't. So it's another way to look at it as well. Um, oh, this is another fight we talked about. This is uh, Showtime 
wise. Robert Easter Jr. and Javier Fortuna is signed and delivered for the co-feature for Lamont Peterson and Spence coming up January 20th. I think it's a good fight. You know, Fortuna has another mandatory that's going to be kind of tough coming up anyway. Um, like I mentioned last week, he's kind of been on that every other for a little bit now, so he's got a tough fight, then kind of a stay busy, maybe a good style. I think stylistically this could be interesting for a while and fun, but also because Fortuna has athleticism, he has power, he has speed, but his chin is suspect. So I think I think Easter Jr. is going to actually score a knockout here, but I think it'll be fun getting there, basically. Also, part of the undercard of that Barclays Center Showtime June 20th card, Marcus Brown returns, and so does uh, Kawanaki, that, that Polish heavyweight. So that's pretty cool to get him back, and obviously why not put him back right there in Barclays, get the Polish people out as well. So that's a nice nice little uh, co-feature, I'd say. I like the Fortuna fight, Easter Jr. fight. It's not a bad fight. I think, like I mentioned, st stylistically, um, that's pretty good. Now, as far as rumors go, February 17th, Danny Garcia and Brandon Rios are scheduled to fight in the co-feature, at least the undercard. I don't know if it's a co-feature or undercard. David Benavides versus Ronel Gavril. And Gavril, that was a good fight. So I'm really, you know, we got two re rematch fights I talked about. One with Bartholomew. Now this one, Benavidez, a young champ who just got the belt and is going to take on his toughest challenge again. It was, a, it was a tough fight. I thought he barely won it, but I'm glad he's given the rematch. We heard about Las Vegas for this one. Um, we also heard New York City, but I doubt they're going to do a Barclays card or a New York City card when they got late January and then another one March 3rd. So anyway, Danny Garcia coming back against Brandon Rios and David Benavides and uh, Rano Graville. Another one to look out on that possible card, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure how they're doing this or where they're going to put this fight. But Jose Cito Lopez and, yes, vicious Victor Ortiz. The rematch, part two from a really fun fight the first time, years ago now. I don't know where they're going to put that. I don't know if they'll put that on the Santa Cruz Mares rematch or Broner's fight. I don't really know, but look out for that maybe popping up on that card potentially. I don't know. Maybe they'll be out in L.A. Who knows? Speaking of, it also could be on this card, Adrian Broner versus Omar Figueroa is rumored for the spring or early April, Mayish time. Maybe March, maybe April, maybe May. I, I don't know. That's a good fight, though, Broner and Figueroa. I hope they get that fight figured out, but it sounds like it's in the works. Another fight that we assumed was in the works um, based off the aftermath two Fridays ago with Wilder and Ortiz. <laughs> um, well, Wilder versus Ortiz, March 3rd at the Barclays Center. Sounds like they're really close to finalizing that. Um, now, it sounds like it'd be on Showtime. But I'll tell you what, if they want to have any hope, whether it's Lou DiBella, Al Heyman, Steven Espinoza, Las Vegas, Las Vegas can put some money up for the Wilder-Joshua fight. We know that. But it's really about pay-per-view and how much pay-per-view you can do here, too. And that's a big question mark right now when it comes to Wilder and Joshua in the States, right? Now, your best bet, in my opinion, is putting this on CBS. Now, this March 3rd date has been very kind for them the last couple of years. They did um, – they opened up the PBC series on NBC on that date. Last year they had uh, – or I'm sorry, this year they had Thurman and uh, – they had Thurman in – and Garcia, they were going to have Thurman and Porter, but, you know, obviously that got delayed that year in 2016. So if you want to increase Wilder's, you know, presence, if you put it on CBS, that thing would peak at least three, maybe not, maybe to four million potentially. If you look at CBS has good lead-ins, 
And uh, they've had success when they've done that CBS. So I'm just saying. Now, the Wilder Ortiz storyline and how pumped up people were were for that fight. Now, if you're looking at Showtime and you're like, man, it'd be nice to finally have a fight, you know, even peak, if not average a million, but definitely peak over a million, right? So the, the, the brand for Showtime, maybe they'd want to keep that fight. So it's kind of like, do you want to brand it? Because literally HBO didn't have one card that averaged a million. Now, if you can, and they only had like three fights or two fights that actually peaked at a million this year. So if they can get some fights early on to peak at, close to a million or over a million, now they can say we're actually beating them, you know, for our peak ratings now rather than just quality. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they do. Do you keep building that Showtime brand back, right? Or do you try to get the CBS outlet in there? I don't know. We'll see. Speaking of the Barclays, April 14th, so what, six, seven weeks later, Keith Thurman is rumored to be going against Jesse Vargas. Now that's part of that's one of the guys that Jesse Vargas had talked about. That's one of the guys that he uh, really thought, all right, I want one of those guys, and that's part of the reason he said he signed with Al Heyman. So um, he got himself a stay busy fight. He got through that flying color. Well, maybe not flying colors, <laughs> but he got through it, and he's not cut or hurt or anything. So that's one that uh, was just rumored today. I hadn't heard that prior, or was it yesterday? Keith Thurman versus Jesse Vargas, April 14th at the Barclays Center. So I don't know. We'll see. The Barclays uh, would be really busy because two weeks later, that's supposed to be booked for, um, as I mentioned, Danny Jacobs. Now, they could swap those dates potentially, too. You never know. Or maybe you push back that I, I have no clue. They could tweak some stuff. I remember seeing that with the report. Um, so yeah, that's a that's it's just a lot of news. Most of it's fights that are made, and just a matter of announcing them and, and finalizing the venues. But back to Garcia, I'm gonna get a Garcia rant in here. Then we're gonna go to the phone lines. Okay, two one four. I've been waiting for a while. I see CT as well. Anybody else want to talk, press 1. If not, you're just chilling. That's cool. 646-381-4990 is the number to call. Maybe you're listening live on the browser. Take us with you. 646-381-4990. And obviously that allows you to stay in past the next hour. Once it hits, you know, it's almost hour left of the stream, a little over it. Once that goes away, the only way you're going to listen to the full archive or the full episode is dialing the number or wait for it to archive as a full episode. So back to the Mikey Garcia stuff, okay? I got a Mikey. I don't rant a ton, but here's my Mikey Garcia rant. And when I say Mikey Garcia rant, I think maybe people will take it like, oh, he's going to rant on him. So he's just going to basically jump on the bandwagon of what a lot of people are doing. And that's basically dissecting Mikey Garcia right now and letting a lot of other fighters off the hook at times, right? People still want to act like Mikey Garcia in top rank like that. Like it wasn't smart at the time for him to to hold out considering what was going on with him at top rank. So I think we need to get that clear. Not too many people actually got that clear. And remember, top rank doesn't lose lawsuits often, and they bailed out. Before the judgment came, they bailed out because they knew they were in the wrong, and they were trying to extend Mikey for contracts that he was already getting. There was no raise. You know, there was a lot of in-between stuff, and they tried to wait him out thinking, you know, he's not going to have enough money to wait out, and he did. And so let, let's not, like, rewrite history as far as the top break. Now, he could have he could have not sat out. He could have just – sign the extension to sign a fight and get another fight and, and all that, right? And that's cool. Did he price him, himself out of a fight? Sure. He may have done that, but 
he hasn't really done as much as they're talking about, you know, over there. As far as he's turned this down, he's turned that down, and now people say, "Oh, that was a good move." Now they're now he's at ESPN and he wants to fight Lomachenko. Why'd you leave? Well, it's not that easy, you know. In, in, in top rank, admittedly, so we're actually in the wrong in there because they they pulled out. They they said, "Hey, we'll just release them." They 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 fought that lawsuit though, <laughs> so. Let's 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 get that out there. There's a lot of misinformation there. And then when it comes to Garcia, now I understand when a fighter chirps up on social media saying, "Hey, I'll take that Cotto fight." And when it's offered to him, I understand not taking the fight makes him look bad. Right? I mean, you go from lightweight all the way up to 154. I didn't like it at the time. Now, I didn't think that Garcia or that Cotto's bicep would, you know, give out after seven rounds either. But I wasn't crazy about Mikey going from 135 to 154 anyway, right? Now it's a, it's a career profile boost, uh, especially like, you know, the, the, I think the tickets would have done a lot better if it would have been Mikey Garcia because it would have been seen as a more legitimate fight. To be honest with you, even though hey, Saddam Ali won the fight, great performance, not taking any credit away from him. But they wanted to they offered Cotto. They offered Cotto and Linares in a five fight deal. And as we know, sometimes five fight deals with networks or with promoters can be an option at the end. So maybe it's a six fight, maybe not. Maybe it's just an option where they have that right to refuse, you know? Like, all right, give me your best offer. Let me see if I can match it, type thing. But he did, whereas some of these other guys, Danny Garcia, spent some of these other guys, they didn't throw a counter offer back, or at least didn't make it public. And Mikey did throw an offer back. He said, All right, well, how about Cotto, Lenaris, and I'll give you an extra fight. So it'll be a three fight deal. And they said, No, we don't want to do that. Now, maybe that three-fight deal would have an option on it, so it would look more like a four-fight deal. I don't know. But if you're going to get into a, a five-fight deal, a six-fight deal potentially, and you're going to have Cotto, and then you're going to have Linares, and then you're going to have, what, Matisse? What are the other fights that you're going to have that's going to add value? And how much does Cotto add at that point? That'll be something that we're going to learn. We're going to learn about Saddam and, and how his, you know, it helps that Saddam's from Brooklyn and New York too, right? So at least he fought in his home state, in home city in a sense, not really, but kind of, you know what I mean? Madison Square Garden, he's from Brooklyn, but, you know, that area. So we'll see, you know, we'll see. Obviously the rating did pretty good for them this year, but it wasn't like some great rating. And who knows, that Garcia Cotto fight may have been on pay-per-view, so that could have done 200,000, 300,000 buys. Who knows? I really don't know what that would have done, pay-per-view. Would it have done 300? Would it have done 400? Would it have done 500? I have no clue. I don't think it does 500,000, but who knows? But either way, so you do a pay-per-view, and I always said that think about – think about don't think about Saddam Ali beating – beating Cotto. Don't think about that because we didn't know that was going to happen when the, these deals were on the table. We didn't know that. So you can't play Monday morning quarterback. Some people are putting Saddam Ali in the category of an opponent for Mikey because he was a golden boy. But as we know, that would have been looked at as like a crappy fight prior to this win. It wouldn't have been looked at as something like, dude, you can fight Saddam Ali. Go over there. You know, would you rather have the Heyman side at 147 or the Golden Boy side, Matisse and Ali. But anyway, I always said that if you go up to 150, whatever, 152 or whatever, 154, right? And you beat Cotto, how big is going? So you went to junior middleweight. How big of a fight is Linares? Now, it is bigger than it was, I'll say that, because of the name boost, the profile boost you could get from fighting a name like Cotto. But how big, how much anticipation is there for this Linares fight when you just beat Cotto? 
You know how many people would be like, hey, he should go down a weight class and just fit in where he, right there or fight these 154 pounders. But the Linares fight, although it's worth a little more value, it's definitely, I think, worth more after a Cotto win. I don't think you can deny that. But how – I just don't think people would be as excited about it. Then you're looking at your third opponent. Then it's Matisse. So now I got to go to 154, back to 35, now to 47, just for Matisse. You see what I'm saying? They didn't have that great of an offer for him. And that's, like I said, that's with Cotto being hurt in a, in a fight. He may have beaten Saddam Ali had he not hurt. Now, maybe he wouldn't have. So we can't we we got to play at both sides. We can't just give him a victory either, uh, but we can't just say that that didn't have something to do with him losing those last five rounds. Either way, I can see why Mikey didn't take that deal. Now the whole Linares thing. So Cotto's out of the picture, right? Now the Linares thing, they went back and said, "All right," and I say they, Golden Boy and Dan and Danny and Mikey, right? They talked about the Lenars fight. Now, they said, all right, let's do this Lenars fight with no strings attached, which, okay, that's cool, but let's do it a little bit later in the year. If we want to make this a good fight, let's not do it in January. Let's do it in April. Let's do it in May. Well, Mikey was over here saying, well, I, I, I want to fight. I haven't fought since July. So they actually agreed, golden boy, Eric Gomez, to the press, several members, and same with Mikey Garcia to the press, ES News, Fight Hype, a couple other people that were there in his gym. And so this is what kind of bugs me. It seems like when boxing media members don't get a story, then they act like sometimes the information doesn't exist until they tell you about it. And I understand why they do it, but to me, I think it, if you're going to write this article – saying Mikey Garcia's next fight is a head scratcher. He should have taken the Linares fight. Should have taken the Easter Jr. fight. I get it. Easter Jr. would be a better opponent than Lipinets. But remember, let's back this up. They just said that they didn't. Golden Boy told him he, they didn't want to do it in January in, or February, right after the new year. Let's do it a little later. So they agreed. Both take a fight. And then we'll reconvene and go back in negotiations for the summer. It was, it, this is news. This is news out there. Quoted everything on camera or at least quoted by both sides. So, and then not long after, who, Jorge Linares signs Mercito Hesta. He's fighting January 27th. So, that fight's off the table now till next till later in the year, just as if they planned it. So now you want Mikey. He's he's gonna he's gonna unify the titles in the summer, but you want him to take another unification fight with Robert Easter just to go to another unification fight. You know how rare that is in today's boxing? And when it's done, and I'll give you an example of potentially it's gonna get done this next year. The example, well, a couple times next year. Sometimes it's legit, other times it's not. Now, being in a tournament like the World Boxing Super Series, the semifinals and the finals in the cruiserweight, that's what it's going to be about. It's going to be unified to unify, you know what I mean? So that's cool, but rare, and it's forced, and it's good money they're getting too, by the way. Not to say that Mikey wouldn't get good money for Easter Jr., but my whole point is you want Mikey – to fight Easter Jr. to unify 135 and then go the very next fight this summer, fight another unification fight. That That's where I'm like, well, hold on, dude. Like, calm down. It's not like the easiest route. It's a very hard route. And usually, like, here's an example. Next year, Anthony Joshua might do the same thing. If he takes on Parker... He would be unifying a part, another part of the division. And then if he took on Wilder, he'd be going for undisputed in another unification, right? But let's be honest. Parker and Easter Jr. don't line up skill-wise to me. 
Parker is the weakest link by far at heavyweight. And I I think Takeham may have beaten him. So it happens. I, I mentioned the cruiserweight tournament, but there's the keyword tournament, right? So I'm not going to get bent out of shape at Mikey Garcia because he's going to fight a unification with Linares, the fight that most people want to see. I'm not talking about Lomachenko because Lomachenko, now people are like, oh, look, he's running to 140. Guys, and here's another thing. He got permission to do another fight at 140 because, remember, the WBC called for Linares and Garcia to fight. So in order to keep the belt, he got permission through the belt system to get this fight. And does Lipinitz add to his resume? No. But all these people talk about what Mikey Garcia can be and and what potentially the pay-per-view guy or or the star, or he needs to be a bigger name. And I agree, he should be a bigger name. That break didn't help him. I totally agree with that. However, telling a story is also important when growing a brand. And this fight is is a good fight to lead you to Linares. There's nothing wrong with this fight. Like I said, Lipinets at 12-0 or 13-0, a couple fights ago, even two fights ago, I think people would have saw it as a more dangerous fight. But I think the way he fought in his last fight kind of left a bad taste in people's mouth. And they thought, this guy's just not on his level. So I understand. I totally get that Lipinets is not Easter Jr., and it's not Linares. But the Linares fight was not on the table for the first quarter. And both sides agreed to that. This is facts. And so you have certain media members either going off on social media or writing an article saying this fight's a head-scratcher. Well, I understand it's not the best fight, but if Linares is next, it's still a risk to go up and wait a little bit. And if why not get a belt at another division? We, we talk about growing a profile. You know, when casual fans hear Mikey became only the third guy to go from featherweight to 140 as far as championship belts. Manny Pacquiao and Marquez are the only guys. Now, when a casual fan hears that, they go, wow. And, and Mikey's got how many wins? Okay, cool. Now, I'm not saying this is going to build his – resume in his in his brand and all that but it's not a completely worthless fight for brand building either it adds another weight division championship and he already said i've agreed to go down to face lenara's next that's what i understand like so you're gonna get so bent out of shape and that's where i think some of this Heyman influence comes with the negativity now or the hate negativity is it's called criticism. <laughs> it doesn't negativity is not what I'm saying. I'm talking about or I'm not complaining about criticism. I'm talking about being negative just to be negative. And when people can't figure out this fight, this is a horrible fight. So you're you're expecting him to go to Easter Jr. and then Lenaris after it. That's what you're expecting. But why don't you expect that for each in every fighter then? That, that's my Mikey Garcia rant of the day, okay? I think it's I think people are, are being way too over the top. Now, some people have said, well, the placement of this fight's horrible. I hear you, but San Antonio is a, a fight town, though. They don't get many fights. I remember Broner Maidana, a couple other fights Canelo's fought there as well. And, and they're literally going to, if you go look at the tickets, like they're cheap, right? They're cheap tickets. And they're just mapping out uh, not even a fourth of the stadium. It's the Alamo Dome, but the Alamo Dome does a bunch of different stuff throughout the year where they don't use the whole scale. They didn't bring him to the Aladome to put 40,000 people in there. But to sit there and say, now that's a bad place to to bring this fight. So a Mexican-American fighting in Texas in San Antonio is a bad place to fight? Do we know all the venues open in February in in California? Does everybody know all the venues? 
that that's my point. You know, sometimes people say, oh, it should have been the Staples Center. I remember last year. This should have been at the Staples Center, whatever fight it was. Yeah, the Staples Center wasn't – it was booked all the way through to the midsummer. But they, they want them to, to change all of a sudden. Like, you just got to think it through. I'm not saying putting it in San Antonio, he's going to put 25000 in the in the stadium. Hell no. They have it, you know, they have it, you know, way down. It, it's it's bas- it's basically like not even a fourth of the, the place. So is it the best venue? No, but anytime a Mexican-American fighter – fights in California or Texas, I can't really say it's the worst place for a Mexican-American fighter. And the Garcias have a gym there. They, they've all, they've always said they love San Antonio. Shit, Robert Garcia said the other day he's thinking about moving there. So let's say they sell five, six, seven thousand 7,000 tickets or at least sell 4,500 at Comp 2,000 or whatever, Comp 1,500, whatever it is. I don't know what they'll do here. But it's not the worst place. It's not. It's not that bad of a place. It's San Antonio. That they, they do have fight fans there, guys. So I don't know. I don't know what venues were open in, in, in Southern California. No clue. But I just don't think it's as bad as every. As I shouldn't say everybody, but plenty are saying. And like I said, if you got a problem with him fighting this fight, then just have a problem with other fighters fighting other fights. That's all I'm saying. If you're very overly critical about this, then do it for all fighters. That That's that's the moral of the story. Now, I'm done. I'm sorry. My rant went very long. Um, I just think it's, it's a little over the top. I'm going to shut down the YouTube stream right now. If you want to listen live right now, Follow the link or call 646-381-4990. If it's Thursday or Friday or Saturday or Christmas is coming, it's it's Christmas Eve right now, and you're listening to it on YouTube, I'm speaking in the future, of course, then obviously you just use that link and you'll get to listen to the whole archive. So I'm going to shut it down. 